welcome to Digital Museum. So today is the second of our taster sessions for the new Digital Museum courses. Many of you have joined us over the last two years for many wonderful seminars, including with Dr. Rebecca Simon, who is going to be your, um, well, she's going to be teaching the whole thing. I will just be assisting her. I'm uh, talking about the full course itself. So it's basically going to be Rebecca and I will be host and, well, Rebecca's assistant, really. Um, I'm going to be there to help. But Rebecca Simon is going to be the main lady for that session. As many of you know, I'm Jibanessa Abdullah and I'm the founder and director of Digital Museum. We have been running a number of sessions of seminars and other types of events as well on history, archaeology, language, and many other topics that are relevant to the story of human culture, mainly that is. And so Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Many of you have told me already that you're doing a PhD or at least thinking about it. Uh, can you in the chat, just uh, if you want to type in what your PhD is about. So if you just want to share the topic of your PhD in the chat, please do so. And also for anybody who hasn't uh, attended anything with Digital Museum before, just to let you know that we have a seminar series called Thesis Corner that we have quarterly for PhD and masters researchers to give 15 minutes talks and we have a Q&A as well. Uh, most people so far have been those doing a PhD um, but you know if you're doing a master's you can join in as well. So if you would like to also give a thesis corner talk in future please do let us know in the chat. Uh, we will be in contact. It's uh, deliberately interdisciplinary so we've had talks on all kinds of topics in the past um, history archaeology practical fine art postgrad journalism philosophy um, mixture of interesting topics so yeah you're very welcome to join us for those so please do let us know um, Ah, Serena is uh, is saying uh, she does British Muslim communities engagement with theatre. So that's really interesting, Serena. If you want to come join us for Thesis Corner, I'd love to hear more about that. And uh, Felicia Ronald is talking about how right-wing populists frame climate change. So that's very contemporary at the moment. Uh, we've seen a lot, of, uh, a lot of interesting controversies in respect to that, especially as we're based in, in Glasgow and we had COP26, so very, very, very relevant. Um, I'll mention some of the other ones as well. And we've had Anushka before, um, for Thesis Corner, she's doing alternative Buddhist groups in post-war Sri Lanka. And that's very interesting. And Dr. Shomhita Shen's PhD topic is on Nawabi architecture in Murshidabad during 18th and 19th century. So how fascinating you're all talking about. Uh, so Rebecca, what do you think about some potential for making wonderful best-selling books out of some of those? I think they all could have good potential. And the big thing is you want to think about what, what about your topic you think will speak to people in general or kind of what its wider significance might be, especially, you know, when we're doing something with the PhD, it's so small and niche. 
So when we want to kind of think about turning something into a broader project that a lot of people will engage in, your project will have to kind of expand from its very small subject into something bigger. And you'll kind of want to think like, you know, which intellectual arena, such as, um, you know, Felicia's How Right-Wing Populists Frame Climate Change Immediately, you know, current events, yeah. um, especially today. Um, Serena's British Muslim Communities Engagement with Theater, like that's got lots of potential in lots of different areas, you know, community studies, um, kind of going into uh, Muslim studies, you know, theater studies. There's audiences for all of that. Same with um, Buddhist groups in post-war Sri, Sri Lanka, because you got, you know, so many people are interested in wartime history and so many people will be interested in, you know, different cultures, uh, East Asian cultures. So, um, you know, Nawabi architecture, architecture is a huge field in general as well. And, you know, historical architecture is also very popular. There's stuff you can do with any topic you're doing. You just have to think of like, what about it do you think might interest other people? We know it interests you, but you have to think how is it going to interest someone who knows nothing about the topic. And that's where you want to broaden it. Yeah, great, great. So we've had an early plunge into to some of the, the areas to, to think about. Um, just to introduce uh, Rebecca, for anybody who hasn't met her here or heard her on radio or, or on various other um, podcasts and, and video forums, Rebecca is... Well, Rebecca, if I call you a pirate nut, would that be <laughs> would that be accurate? I mean, probably pretty accurate, I would say. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Rebecca, she spent the whole of her life being obsessed about pirates, um, and uh, so and so much so that uh, her passions has taken her to do a PhD at King's College on uh, Captain Kidd, mm-hmm. and then. She uh, used that PhD to uh, to do her book, and uh, so her book um, is yeah, it's it's about Captain Kidd. And uh, so, Rebecca, could you just tell us a little bit about your your PhD and yeah. uh, and and also how the book relates to that? Yes. So my PhD specifically was about um, the about public executions of pirates in the British Atlantic world and maritime and legal suppression and perceptions. So, you know, again, like like the titles in the chat, very technical. Um, And the way Captain Kidd kind of became a big focus of this is because when I was starting my PhD, I'm sitting in the British Library. I'm a few months in. I had started actually quite a different topic looking at pirates in the English channel, um, but it wasn't grabbing me. So about three months into the PhD, I threw all that out and started over, (laughs) very risky. And I went back to reading a book called Captain Kidd and the War Against the Pirates by Robert Ritchie, which I'd read when I was um, researching piracy for my master's, phenomenal book. And I noticed that Captain Kidd was executed for piracy, but he was taken to East London to Wapping at a place called Execution Dock. Um, And a replica still stands today. Um, It's behind a pub called the Prospect of Whitby, in case anyone's local. Um, And I thought that was interesting because I'd read other books about crime. Um, I read Peter Leinbaum's book, The London Hanged. And I knew that criminals in London were taken to the Tyburn Tree, which sits on the um, on the corner of Hyde Park, just outside Marble Arch Tube Station in West London. And so I was like, oh, why did Captain Kidd get different treatment? I didn't know any of this. So I decided, well, let me look up an article or a book or something like that to read about why this execution process was different and nothing had been written. So I decided I'm going to make this my topic. I want to explore why pirates got this different treatment. And I initially was researching all through the lens of Captain Kidd because it was, he was, his experience was so well documented in terms of his very lengthy and very drama filled trial, which was published verbatim, along with the ordinary of Newgate's report. So Newgate is the prison he was forced into and the ordinary is the spiritual chaplain providing counsel and trying to get repentance from the prisoners. And they would give speeches at the scaffold and he would publish his work as well. So we have all these observations. And so, you know, there was lots of stuff to kind of come out of that. One thing about new British, the new, uh, you know, the British legal system, um, the high court of admiralty, which is in charge of all maritime legal affairs, 
perceptions of piracy and how so many people turned out for this. And so when I was um, discussing about turning my PhD into a trade book for a popular audience, um, my editor was initially like, you know, well, let's make this a general book about, you know, pirates. And I said, that's been done <laughs> many times over. And I actually focused on this very dramatic figure um, in my doctorate. And I think it would be quite interesting to look about how perceptions of pirates changed using him as a framing device because so much written about pirates um, or so much we know about pirates, you know, we can really go back to looking at Captain Kidd's trial just because it is so detailed. And it did change a lot of the ways that people began perceiving it. So he became the framing device of my book. And from there, I was kind of able to build out and I took loads of my PhD and was able to kind of rejig it into a more Captain Kidd kind of focused type of work and um, really broaden it also for a wider audience. Also, I think for your topic, because pirates are so iconic, whether we have the wrong impression or not, people are fascinated by pirates. People dress like pirates for fancy dress. And as you say, in East London, you have outside the prospect of Whitby, you have the hangman's noose. Um, it's not a landmark pub in the sense it's not as famous as some of them, but it is a historic pub with quite a pedigree for having various goods being brought um, in uh, to that. And, uh, and for anybody who doesn't know that part of London, there is actually a beach just outside the pub. The River Thames has a beach. So in a way, it's another thing that is quite helpful in capturing the public imagination of seeing this hanging noose outside a pub that's full of history. Just to go over, obviously um, having passion really helps. Um, let's now talk a bit about the full course itself. What we're going to what we're going to have, it's going to be eight weeks long. We're going to do it in one hour sessions. That's once a week for eight weeks. There are going to be some assessments, but don't worry, we're not going to get you to write lots of very lengthy essays for this. Uh, but there will be some questions at the end of the sessions just to see how you're doing. Um, and some of the sessions will also have the odd poll and quiz. Rebecca will be using presentation and conversations to communicate ideas and to demonstrate certain things. And of course, video recordings um, that you can access later as well. So Rebecca, we talked about the fact that for doing this, we're also going to look at examples of books that you particularly like. Any in particular you want to just recommend to these lovely people today? Any, any books at all? Yeah, absolutely. Like there have been so many academic books that have clearly been turned into great things for a popular audience. So the ones that just kind of cross my mind immediately are um, Yuval Noah Harari's book, Sapiens, which is a history of humanity, basically. And that's a really broad topic and he covers it brilliantly. And it's really readable. It's, it's technical, but it's readable. So, you know, any audience can dive into it and he's not talking down to the audience either. Another book I really enjoy is Emperor of All Maladies. I forget the author's name. Oh, but yes, 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 yes. The history of cancer. So if there's anyone in here who maybe is doing something more on the scientific realm, this is a really great example of how medical history has been presented to an audience. And what's interesting is that the person who writes it is a doctor. Yes, that yes. book. And he kind of interjects a lot of his own experiences with his cancer patients along by looking at yeah. you know, examples of cancer presented from ancient Egypt, pretty much, or ancient skeletons all the way up until today with the development. So I think that book is really great. I'm looking at my shelf. There's um, another book. It's a history book, but um, it's called The Edge of the World, How the North Sea Made Us Who We Are um, by Michael Pye. And oh. this book is done really well. I, I think he, the author is a journalist, I think. 
Um, and they've kind of taken, you know, big history of the North Sea, looking at Vikings and other sailors and kind of really showing how it kind of really changed communities. Again, very readable. They've got like images of book plates in the middle, which makes it quite, you know, a lot more accessible. And at the same time, you know, it's a very, you know, the author did so much work because you've got pages and pages of references and an index. So it's not talking down to the audience either. I've not read the Michael Pye book, but Rebecca also mentioned, uh, well, she talked about the Emperor of Maladies by Siddhartha Mukherjee, and who is a doctor by profession. He's written a number of really good books. And this is a Pulitzer Prize winner as well. So a highly recommended book. Uh, we will be recommending a number of books, not as compulsory reading lists, but things that are interesting books that are very readable and yet robust and erudite and a very intelligent and readable books that you know um, you would enjoy reading. So uh, there are um, recommendations that we will make from that perspective. We're also going to look at things like how to write, um, look at writing blogs and articles, and Rebecca will be covering best practice, but also things like uh, looking at the anatomy of a blog post. So some of you might already be writing blogs and some of you, for some of you, this will be a completely new thing. But we will be looking at what makes a good blog and how to start blogs and articles and different types of language. Um, because obviously for an academic book and a PhD, the language is going to be different. Absolutely. So getting your work to a wide audience is really important. And the best, and kind of the number one thing to do is, yes, you have to make it very readable, which means taking away our field jargon for the most part. You don't always have to, um, especially if but you have to remember that you are catering to an audience that probably does is are either people who are already very enthusiastic but want to be able to read something you know at um, a really good pace or people who know nothing about your topic and but you, so you have to be able to really be able to communicate that really well remember when we're writing a phd yes we're writing about a topic very passionate to us very niche to us but at the same time we are presenting it to our peers who are going to know a lot of kind of the jargon and the theory you know jargon and theory and historiography and all that type of analysis doesn't really belong in a popular book you could put it into footnotes you could put it into maybe like an appendices something like that but the reader wants to know about the subject in a very clear way. And so really good idea, way to practice this is like what uh, Jubinesso was just saying, writing a blog post, for, in for instance, starting that. You can do it on WordPress really easily and for free. And you just kind of present, you know, a very condensed, like few paragraph subject. Um, you know, I find it's always helpful on a blog to include references that you use just at the bottom in case people want to check them out. But again, you want to think about your audience as someone who just doesn't know your topic. And so you want to write in, um, in a more simple fashion. Um, when I, I, I used to teach writing and I would always tell my students, don't use um, a 25 cent word when a five cent word means the exact same thing. Uh, because you, again, you want people to be able to read it quite quickly. So when I was writing my book, you know, th it takes practice. I was always pretty good at doing that because I've always wanted to be a writer and I always really enjoy getting stuff out to the public. I wrote lots of blogs. I wrote popular articles. Even during my doctorate defense, one of my examiners said, oh yes, this reads like a popular history, which wasn't meant as a compliment, but I was like, well, I want it to be readable. Um, mm -hmm. But when I was writing my book, you know, I still have a lot of academic jargon in my head and everything. And my editor kept saying, like, no, punch it up, punch it up, make it more entertaining. Like they were kind of over the top of what they wanted in terms of like popular readership. Um, like they wanted like slang in there. They wanted, you know, that's not always as common. But, you know, I really actually had to work hard on making it as readable as possible. So what I was doing is I was sending kind of 
drafts to my best friend. And, you know, some people might say, of course, they're going to be nice. My best friend is not going to be nice if she doesn't think something's good. So that's also good. And she's very much like, she's like, I don't know anything about your subject. I hate academia. I hate all of that. It has to be readable to me. I'm your audience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she would come back and be like, this was boring. This was hard to read. She changed this. And so that was a good second pair of eyes. Um, yeah. So you just have yeah. to remember that you are not writing to academics. You are writing to anyone. You want any person to be able to read your book, whether they're another academic, whether they're someone who just has a casual interest. So, yeah. 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 So um, you, you mentioned that the publisher wanted you to kind of really not ham it up, uh, obviously, but to kind of up the excitement level and, and uh, the, the, the swashbuckling element perhaps, but um, did they, were you under pressure to, 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 to find buried treasure? Was I on, uh, do you mean <laughs> literally or metaphorically? <laughs> it's usually the first question people ask is like, you yeah. know, buried treasure from pirates when the fact is buried treasure doesn't exist, um, mm -hmm. which a lot of people really kind of, people either get disappointed or they kind of start losing their mind about it and try to prove me wrong, um, which, you know, they mm. don't. So. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I suppose if you have even someone like Samuel Pepys burying cheese and various other things because of uh, because of the plague and the great and then the great fire, well, I mean, you, that, that's a kind of buried treasure, but it's a different <laughs> a different kind of uh, buried treasure. Um, yeah, so so really. Um, I, I think what I will do is actually I've had uh, a couple of other chats, um, things in the chat. Um, Naomi's talking about she's she's um, she's going to have pi she says pirates come into one of the books that I'm working on, a book on Berkhamsted and the locality. Mm -hmm. Peter Pan, for example, was based on a family in Berkhamsted. Oh, yeah. That's so, right. J.M. Barry's neighbors or like kids or something that he knew, something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Oh, that's that's very cool. Yeah, yeah. So we look forward to that, Naomi. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, Malcolm is recommending um, She Merchants, Buccaneers and Gentlewoman, uh, British Woman in India. Um, oh, very cool. Yeah. I haven't heard of that. So that... Yeah, I really, I'm going to look for Hickman's. a copy of that. Yeah, no, I've not read that, but uh, yeah. but thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, yeah, so so we're going to cover how to write a blog. Um, so that'll be a, a, a session and also different styles of, of, of language, you know. So Rebecca is going to go um, over and discuss with you um, how you might be we'll we'll you know look at examples of of academic language and how to then convert that um into more uh popular style uh and also we're going to be covering uh things on for example um the the first steps to writing the book um and uh then uh, the, well, the different steps to writing a book, the first, the, 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 the middle bit, how to sustain a middle, and also how to finish your book. So, because um, that, that's, that's really important, isn't it, Rebecca? Yeah. Uh, just to, you know, because a lot of, we, we often have uh, really good ideas. And also, if you've spent such a long time doing a PhD, you're you're kind of so focused on one way of communicating because that's how you've had to communicate to then uh, convert that and know how to start so that it actually speaks to a different audience yeah. is quite a, a quite a challenge. So um, yeah, so so I think I think it'll be great to have you uh, going over. Well, how would you, you feel about how you, would you feel about so for some of these PhD examples if if uh, for example, Felicia mentioned how right-wing populists from uh, frame climate change. Uh, I, I mean, how would you feel if somebody gave you an example of theirs uh, to sort of suggest, ah, and this might be one way. As an example, if, if somebody wanted to, would you be up for that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think that would be really great because they would be um, also really good specific examples that 
we can really kind of grab onto since it'll be coming from one of us. So absolutely. Great. And I know that some of the people who haven't said anything yet in the chat are also doing quite interesting PhDs because I met them before. Richard Kendall, for example, is doing an interesting PhD. Richard, I'm not going to attempt to say the title of your PhD, but if you want to write it down here, please do. Um, I think also, you know, sustaining a middle when you're writing something popular um, is there something that you want to comment on why that's really important? Um, about kind of framing the book with the beginning and the end? Yeah, or, and, and yeah. why why uh, a middle um, mm-hmm. really, uh, yeah, if, if there's anything you want to, to say at this stage about that. Yeah, so of course the, the meat of the book does come from the middle, but a lot of times there is an issue with books when we get to the middle, it, some information can start falling a little flat, um, especially if you want to get to, you know, what is this author really writing about? Because sometimes we can get lost in a lot of background information or tangents. Um, I think I was reading, like, for example, this is a brilliant book, um, but I was reading a book called The Great Mortality, um, which is about the Black Death. And I had trouble getting through it because when the author was talking about, I think it was burial practices, he went into about three pages talking about like the the, the immediate medieval invention of the hoe um, to be able to kind of cultivate and dig in the land. And I was like, this is not what I'm interested in. Um, I'm here for black death. So we kind of have, like, we didn't need three pages on it. So we kind of have to remember to think about that sort of thing is like, you know, really staying on topic. You know, you want to get into the wider subject, but you just have to remember the readers are there because they want to read about what the title and what the back of the book is saying. So it's really important to frame also the beginning and frame also the end, because the beginning, as we know, um, you know, as we know, it, an introduction is supposed to grab the reader and it's also got to tell the reader this is what this is what I'm going to be teaching you and this is what I'm going to be convincing you of because you know with a popular book you are still trying to drive a point home and the conclusion is important because you want to of course you want to sum up what you've written but you want to really kind of end it in a very satisfying way for the reader so a lot of times in popular books we might see an epilogue for instance, um, you know, kind of saying like, you know, what what the future is, what is like a sort of related topic that didn't quite fit in, but is still very significant in terms of wrapping up what you're saying. So they want you want the readers to be really, really satisfied. And you want to just remember that, you know, if you're if a reader is coming in to read about again, I'm using this example because it's off the top of my head. Like if I'm coming in to read a book about the Black Death, that's what I really want to be reading about. Um, So that's something you always have to keep in mind about your reader. That's what they're there for. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Thank you. Um, Yeah, so I have in the Q&A, Erin O'Halloran has asked, um, could I ask about the structure of the course? I'm in the final stages of writing my book, but interested in information about um, e.g., agents connecting with editors, handling revisions. Uh, Yes, Erin, that is also going to be covered in the latter parts of the course. So after the writing of the book, then we're going to be covering that as well, yes. Um, And uh, how to promote and things like that. So all of those are going to be covered. And so we, we look forward to that. Erin, um, if you want to just write in the chat what your PhD is about. Um, and, and Richard mentioned here, um, his PhD is on the revival of ancient Greek site of Olbia on the northern Black Sea coast, that's modern Ukraine, in uh, first century AD. And um, he did he did actually give us a talk about that at Thesis Corner. Again, if any of you would like to do something similar, uh, give a talk that is on an aspect of your PhD research at a Thesis Corner, please do put that in the chat because it will be great to hear what you've got to say. Um, I've actually had a question sent to me from John 
pollard in advance so um, the question rebecca was how important is it to work out who your audience is before committing to writing uh well to committing to trying to get your book published your audience is always really important but with what, what's kind of cool about writing a trade book is that you want it to be for a large general audience. So, you know, since a lot of times when we're trying to publish, say, a monograph, you're thinking this needs to be good for academics, it needs to be good for um, undergrad and graduate students. We're thinking more broader than that. And we're thinking about you're really writing it for, again, a broad audience that doesn't really know about your subject. Mm -hmm. So that's always really important. You have to remember, they're not going to be an expert on this the way I am. Um, they're going to maybe not understand what the high court of admiralty is i have to go in and explain that really briefly um, so that way they know so i can reference it for the rest of the book without having to re-explain it or um assuming the audience knows what it is at the same time you don't want to talk down to the audience either mm. um you know you want to treat them as if they are you know relative you know intelligent people no one likes to be talked yeah. down to no one wants to read a book that feels like it's pandering them because then it feels a little inauthentic or it just feels like like oh this book is a bit too colloquial or something like that. So, but then yeah. again, some people like that when it sounds like the, the author is talking to them. So, you know, you just want to think about the type of, in a way, think about your type of audience, you know, do you want the book to be really fun and light? So people who, you know, like fun and light things, maybe listening to it on audio book would really engage with, or do you want it to be a bit denser while still making it readable to really get a lot of um, really good information across? But the big thing in terms of your audience is, when, when you write a book proposal, that is one of the questions they ask is who is this for? So yes, a general audience, but then you're gonna wanna say, um, for instance, Richard, yours is about the revival of the ancient Greek site. And that's a good topic because some of the most popular trade books about history um, that get published are ancient history, um, including, you know, like Greece and Rome, the Tudors and the world wars. Those like the top three. And so what you'd want to do is kind of discuss like, you know, here's target audience. Um, people who are interested in ancient Greek history. Um, and then you're going to want to think about some of the broader things. Obviously, I don't know what, what the broader themes are in there, but maybe people who are, um, you know, maybe interested in, for example, architecture, maybe warfare, um, you know, culture, art, that sort of thing. So, you know, they are going to want to be like, okay, who's going to be interested in what? Because that's also how the publisher is going to need to know how to market the book as well. Mm, so yeah. you do want to think about, you are going to have to think about something specific. So such as for me, when I wrote my book, Why We Love Pirates, of course, I was, you know, writing like people who, um, you know, I wrote you know, this book, I want it to work for academics. I want it to work, you know, I want it to work for general audience. I want it to be worth it to an academic, um, but I want it to be very readable. So fans for pirates, fans for pop culture, fans of, you know, executions, like, you know, cause that's sort of like a grabbing word, you know, fans of, you know, mythology, maritime mythology. So, cause that's gonna kind of reach out to a lot of really niche groups. Yeah, that's interesting. Fans for executions. Um, you know, true crime <laughs> dramas are popular. Yeah, executions are fascinating. Uh, when I uh, did archaeology, because I was looking at a lot of human and animal bone remains, and one of the things that we do look at, uh, as well as uh, fractures, is how to recognize uh, things like if someone's vertebra shows evidence that they've been hung. So I remember clearly looking at that, and that was uh, fascinating. Um, I wasn't going around following every hanging, but I can imagine something like that, even though niche would, uh, would fire the imagination, really. And something else I just thought of as well as you're going to kind of want to um, also put down, um, this will be a, a, you know, a, a good book for someone who wants an introduction to piracy, or this will be a good book for people familiar with ancient Greek history that want to dive deeper yeah, yeah, into yeah. a specific subject. So this is all stuff you would put in a book proposal. Yeah. You, you mentioned trade book. For the, those yeah. who don't know what you mean by a trade book, because usually if someone's hearing the word trade, they're thinking it's specifically to a, a job. So, so do, <laughs> do, yeah. right. Right. It's, a, it's to practice the trade, you know. 
Um, so, so um, do you do you want to just say what you mean by a trade book? Yeah, so a trade book is basically a book meant for a popular audience rather than an academic audience. So these are going to be books that are, you know, a lot of monographs can go up to, um, you know, in dollars, like, you know, $70, $50. Like, you know, those aren't books for the most part that um, a general audience are going to buy. That's what, you know, us academics are going to hope to be in a library or we're going to grit our teeth and bear it um, to try to spend our own money on it. Like I've had to do a bit during the pandemic because... All libraries have been closed. So um, a trade book is a book um, by a general audience, or I'm sorry, it's a book by, um, you know, a general publisher, not an academic publisher. And it's a publisher that gets books into bookstores. Yeah. So, so that way, um, you know, and they're going to cost, you know, $20, something like that, that like anyone's going to buy. Um, it'll be easily accessible on Kindle. It'll be really easily accessible on, uh, as an audiobook on Audible. So that's what trade is meant for a mass audience, mm. not like an, just an academic audience. So it's going to be accessible. It's going to be affordable. You will hopefully find it in a bookstore or, you know, it'll show up really easily on an Amazon search, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Great. Great. Uh, thank you. I just want to, because um, a lot of the examples that we've had today are are based on um, historical content, mm -hmm. but uh, this course um, uh, is w would appeal to people who are doing uh, lots of other uh, other mm -hmm. types of subjects as well. Yeah. Um, so it's not just for history. So Digital Museum is actually interested in a whole range of topics. Um, mm -hmm. As it happens, um, many of the uh, the talks have been, you know, history has been a, a large component. But if you are doing, um, you know, history of science or or about um, previous pandemics, if you want to go into the sort of into the deep science about it, mm -hmm. uh, then then that's also relevant. I just want to give an example of a um, well, somebody was asking about this, if I can just uh, and, and their PhD is on optical sensor systems for aero engine monitoring. Mm -hmm. um, and he's asked, um, what's the scope? Uh, how likely is it to get something like that as a, a mass market bestseller audience? Yeah. Well, for something like that, first of all, um, like immediately, and this is very obvious, but immediately the title has to be written in <laughs> non-academic English. Yeah. Um, you know, so you want the audience to see the title and know exactly what it means. And something like that is clearly going to be, you know, very focused. If that book is going, in order to market it to a, a more of a mass audience, um, you know, these are what really successful um, nonfiction trade books do in history and sciences is, of course, they're, you know, we've talked about the language, you know, writing, you know, make the topic broader, you know, you want to introduce them to the, something like this, audiences are going to need to get introduced to. So it's going to need to be written in a way that the audience can engage in. You're going to, a big thing that really works in nonfiction, such as if he, this person's able to do it, is to include stories or real life examples that the audience can connect to. Um, so, um, you know, and his book is clearly going to be marketed to more people who are going to be more interested in science and engineering is what it sounds like. So, of course, the stories he's going to put in there are going to be, are going to have to be more um specific to kind of wider examples of, um, within that subject that the audience is going to be able to connect to. You want to humanize your subject as well. Um, and so if he's able to do that, that will be marketable. You know, people, you know, their science is, a, people are very interested in science. People are very in, interested in engineering. So that absolutely can be marketed, mm -hmm. but that's going to have to just broaden out and, you know, find ways to humanize your subject, really connect with your audience, get real world examples in there and, or get stories in there. And you can do that with 
every subject. You know, um, the book Emperor of All Maladies, like I said, the author throws in his experience as a doctor um, and examples of his patients. When he talks about the history, he's not just, he goes into all the medical jargon and he goes into all the experiments and the science behind it, but he's also really kind of looking at the scientists as human beings, not just simply so-and-so invented this, but kind of, you know, really sort of interjecting, you know, maybe what they, you know, hopefully you can find out like what their thoughts would have been. Maybe they left some journals or something or what you do. Sometimes you almost have to write a little bit like a novelist and kind of, you know, sort of put in um, some of what their thoughts and feelings might have been. Again, it's all about connect, um, connecting with the audience. Mm -hmm. So the audience can feel this and it doesn't matter what your subject is. You want to, you yeah. can do that with anything. Yes, there are lots of very exciting science books. Um, I find uh, physics exciting anyway. And uh, things like the double helix, you know, discovery of DNA, that's a really fascinating read. And also there's uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who wrote a lot about biology and natural sciences. A lot of his books were popular books and um, on essays, um, hen's teeth and horse's toes on evolution. Uh, so you can actually write best-selling books on anything. It's just how you see it that can connect with people that um, makes it readable or not. So, so uh, knowing how to write it is very important, but um, you know, lots of uh, topics can communicate uh, to people and, and be of interest. Yeah, another really good example of that, I think Kip Thorne wrote this on the science of interstellar. And that's mm -hmm. that book is very, you know, that grabs you right away because interstellar was a pretty big film released in 20. 14. It's one of my favorite films of all time, which is one of, one of the reasons why I'm looking at it. And because I have a fascination with astronomy. And so, you know, he was the he was the advisor and Kip Thorne had either worked with or was a student of Stephen Hawking. And so he was like a physicist and an astronomer and, you know, kind of going into like, you know, here are what the theories of black holes are here are, and here's the evidence for it. And he also kind of talks a bit about experience, uh, the experience of working with the film. And so, um, and that's a way for people to connect, you know, they'll recognize the names, they'll recognize the film. Sorry, leaf blowers are now going to be blowing. I'm sorry for the noise. Um, apartment living. Um, so um, that like, that's a good book that's going to grab you. And it's about physics. It's about theory, um, you know, including, you know, string theory, wormholes, et cetera, et cetera, very technical stuff. But that is something to connect with the audience right away it was a big blockbuster film by a very popular director, Chris Nolan, and very famous actors like Matthew McConaughey and uh, Anne Hathaway, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just another yeah. example that I just thought of right now. Yes, yes. And um, so Erin uh, uh, mentioned her uh, topic. She's writing about the end of the British Empire in India mm -hmm. and the Middle East between 1920s and 1940s. Yeah. So, so Erin, um, you're from you, what you said in, in the q and I gather that's a book that you're actually working on at the moment rather than a PhD. So you, you're working on a book. You've done a PhD before, um, perhaps. Uh, yeah. Ah, yes. PhD in the bag. So uh, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. So, so yes, yeah, so that, 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 um, uh, that sounds really interesting. And there's a lot of, a lot of potential and, and, and a lot of people are very interesting in that at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, uh, Naomi writes again, for practical reasons, during the pandemic, the focus of my research has been local uh, while not losing my deep interest in, in empire, what I have come to realize is that Berkhamsted is a microcosm of empire. The connections are truly staggering. Well, there you go, uh, Naomi. So you, you've captured in that one chat comment how it's so relevant to a wider audience and why yeah. people would want to read. And, and I, you know, seeing that, I, I want to I want to read it and you also brought in um, you know you you, you mentioned uh, Peter Pan and yeah that'll um, grab an audience you know so, so you've got Peter Pan in there and also Empire and um, other global connections so immediately uh, a, a lot of people are thinking well I want to read that 
Yeah, that's something like that is going to attract a big audience because, you know, so many people are fascinated by empire and um, it's always really interesting to find how maybe a small area or an area that people might not know off the top of their head could actually have such a wide reaching um, place within empire. So you have to really kind of beef that up, talk that up, but you're also going to attract people who are very into local history. So, um, you know, that's also a really, a, and that's a big audience. Like, you know, some people are like, oh, local history, that's small. Not really. Um, mm. You know, a lot of people are interested in very specific examples as well. Mm. Local history has a lot of wider connections. And also, especially now, people are looking at local history because, you know, you've got things like the UCL database on slavery, where you can look up connections to local areas and certain families. You can find lots of fascinating content. And with other aspects of history that have global connections, you know, like why, how an area uh, you know grew out of a very small village or something like that. All sorts of economic and other global, uh, well, wider global connections that are truly fascinating, often um, are, you know, of great interest. So thank you for sharing that with us, Naomi, and also everybody else um, for sharing your PhD and your questions. As mentioned, the course is going to be eight weeks long. So that's eight one hour sessions. Uh, they're going to be at this time. So that's five o'clock, 5 p.m. Uh, you know, UK time, uh, because uh, what I hadn't mentioned today, but have in previous sessions uh, with Rebecca is that she's based in Los Angeles and it is nine o'clock in the morning there now. So that's why we chose a time that's convenient for these two eight hour difference time zones. And so what's going to happen is that each class will be an hour long. So that's eight sessions of one hour. And after the course, if people want to have a sort of graduation seminar, if anybody wants to just give a five minute presentation on what they want to do with, um, well, book wise with their PhD, and then just to tell us a little bit about your PhD and what you plan to do in relation to creating a book out of it, then that will be um, wonderful. So if there's enough of you wanting to do that, then we'll do a sort of graduation seminar session after the eight weeks. And uh, so it's um, if you want to, then uh, let me know and I'll be uh, very, um, I'll, I'll organize that. Uh, and during these sessions, we will bring some of you on camera, uh, that is if you want to. So if you want to have a conversation and join us on camera, it's not compulsory, but if you'd like to do that, then we will bring some of you on camera. And also some of you um, I know are happy to talk, but not on camera, well, that's okay too. And it should be a fun course and there will be a certificate. So it's going to start on uh, the 2nd of May. Uh, we are going to, um, it's going to be once a week. So every Monday, so that's Monday, 2nd of May. And after this, I'll send you um, email links to Friday session. So we have another taster session and that's on how to format your PhD. Uh, lots of people, um, lots of uh, talk and chat on social media on what a headache it is to try and format your PhD the way it's meant to be formatted and how to or uh, how on earth do you do all that and some of the problems and headaches that um, you know that that people have had trying to do that so we're going to the, to that's the reason we're going to do that course I've also been um, over a number of years now, as well as uh, founder and director of Digital Museum, I'm also a senior digital learning expert. I'm a digital learning consultant also at the University of the Arts in London. And I've been teaching for a number of years and doing workshops on a, a variety 
of uh, digital topics. And one of those is a variation on the course that um, we're going to start uh, later, the longer course that the taster session is just going to give you a flavor of. And uh, that's, um, you know, the longer course that I've been doing at uh, various universities was um, on how to format your PhD using Word, Photoshop and InDesign and bringing in other materials. So the longer course um, is going to be a variation on that, but using mainly Word. In the taster session, we'll discuss what we're going to do and I'll show you certain things that we will be looking at. So that'll be on on Friday, uh, 2 p.m. GMT. Um, so that's this Friday coming up. And just to come, oh gosh, another question by Naomi. So the names of individuals connected with Burke um, in one way or another are truly staggering. Um, I feel that this is material that is calling out to be the basis for a costume TV drama series. Yes, I think I think we need you to write it. So we look forward to seeing that. So yes, we're excited about that. So that's great. Um, we're going to wrap up very soon. Um, if there are any last things, are there any last things that you want to say, Rebecca, just to send us on our way? Yeah, and something I just thought of is, you know, when you're thinking about writing your book and you, you know, like who's this, who's going to want to read this blah, blah, blah. Like what else can I do to make, to make it interesting or relevant? Think about yourselves because in your about the author, it's going to say, you know, this was written by so-and-so PhD. And so automatically if people, if people are looking at the about the author, they're going to be like, Oh, this is good. This is written by someone legit. This is written by someone who really knows the topic. Um, you know, there are going to be people who very much look for that. And so that alone is a really great way of marketing yourself. And when you're writing your book proposal, that's one of the questions is, you know, why are you the best person to write about this subject? And this is where, you know, you really build up your reputation and, you know, you really, really go deep into it. Now, I am absolutely not talking down about journalists at all um, right now, but sometimes, you know, people will see a difference, um, you know, like two history books on the same subject, one written by a journalist, one written by a historian, you know, some people might question which one might be better. And, um, you know, the historian knows the history, knows the theory, knows how to research it, but the journalist knows how to write for an audience. So, you know, that's kind of something to compare yourself with you. And that's why journalists oftentimes are the ones publishing the best-selling books. You kind of want to, um, kind of want to go, you know, think about what they're doing, but also remember you as the expert by really showing you're the expert, that is a really good, great way to kind of push your stuff forward because people are going to know this person knows, and I am learning something real here, like definitely something real because, you know, I know, I know today's culture is weird about education and elitism, blah, 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 but people are going to want to know that what they're reading is coming from someone direct from the source. The takeaway message is uh, you're doing a PhD. Uh, I know some of you have said in the registration that you're thinking about it and some of you are actually doing your PhD. And as Erin mentioned, hers is in the bag and some of you are in the middle of your PhD at the moment. And if you are doing all that work, then I think it's a wonderful opportunity to communicate that to a wider audience that are going to be able to appreciate the research, um, all that research that you've done. So I think that's a wonderful opportunity. Your topic sounds so interesting. Um, I think it will be wonderful to see your books uh, that come out for this. So we look forward to that. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been, it's been great fun. And thank you for all the things that you've written in your chat. Uh, we're going to wrap up now. And so uh, see you on Friday. Have a great rest of the day. Wherever you are in the world, take care and thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.